There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, the lovely and talented Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Hello. Supernatural News Desk seems to have a big stack of supernatural news piling up. I would like to try something new on today's episode, Tim. You say? I would like to intersperse the news with the parashare. You're mixing the chocolate with the peanut butter, Dave? Oh, yes. You got your chocolate on my peanut butter, and I'd like to get my peanut butter all over your chocolate, Tim. So I thought what would be interesting is maybe you read a story or two. I read a few parashares. You read Mm -hmm. another news story or two. I read a few parashares. And we can kind of mix it up just because, you know, I figured instead of just one of us reading continuously for an hour mm-hmm. we can break it up and 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 give a, a variety of different kind of things going on so news and parashare stories as we uh roll out this we'll, we'll try it today if people like it we'll maybe continue doing it but we also promised we we're going to roll something out on today's episode tim and here it is are you ready ready <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> announcing the beyond the darkness voicemail you can now call any time of day or night and reach Dave and Tim. You can call and leave us voicemail messages of love and compassion. You can tell us how you hate our guts. Ooh. You can also call and leave a voicemail paranormal encounter. So instead of typing it all up, you can just call and tell us your story. And by doing that, you're giving us permission to utilize that story on an upcoming episode of Beyond the Darkness. So here's the number. Jot it down. 651-300-4977. That's 651-300-4977. It's now easier than ever to touch Dave and Tim. What? You know, get in touch with us. Tim. Oh, oh, they right. just dial the phone number 651-300-4977. You can also text message us. Lame. But if you want to leave a voicemail for us and again, tell us your thoughts. If you have guest ideas, if you like topics, what you don't like about specific topics, you know, I mean, we'll listen to those and, and you know, judge them with a grain of salt. But you're still able to reach out and contact <laughs> us. But we want to hear your stories. So they're not just typewritten versions of the stories. I want to hear your encounter. So call and leave a voicemail telling us about your encounters with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, monsters, myths, legends, Ouija boards, demonic possession, angelic intervention, funny paranormal stories, scary paranormal stories, sad paranormal stories, happy paranormal stories. We want to hear them all. 651 300 4977. 651 300 4977. Starting next week, we will begin integrating those stories into our program. How's that sound, Tim? Sounds like a plan to me. I like the sound of that. I also like the sound of this. You know that we like to help Second Harvest Heartland. We've been doing it now for 10 years. And you listen during the weekends to the best in paranormal talk radio with Beyond the Darkness. I host a show Monday through Friday, Midnight in the Desert, and it is another anomalous talk radio show that's live on the air from 9 p.m. till midnight Pacific time. For you on the East Coast, that's midnight till 3 a.m., and I know that's too late for a lot of you. And you want to subscribe, you've been on the fence post, here's what you can do. Subscribe in the month of July. It's $4.99, it gets you access to every one of the episodes, plus all of the past archives going all the way back to Art Bell's original episodes of Midnight in the Desert. So you get, I think, three, three and a half years worth of content for $4.99 a month. But if you sign up in the month of July 
four dollars of that first month is going to be donated directly to second harvest heartland and that's going to go a long way to help feed our friends neighbors co-workers relatives people in need within our communities here in the united states and this is a program that we've worked with for many years because we like them we trust them and we know that the money goes directly to that source for every one dollar we get Three meals are supplied to a person in need. So go subscribe right now to midnightinthedesert.com slash hunger. That's midnightinthedesert.com slash hunger. Everybody that signs up during the month of July, your $4 of your $4.99 is going to go directly to Second Harvest Heartland. The other 99 cents is kept for administration and streaming costs. I hope you understand that. But the balance for the month of uh, July for new subscribers only will go to Second Harvest Heartland. So help us give back. Help us continue to do the good work that we do in helping communities around the world by helping us with Second Harvest Heartland. All right, Tim, let's uh, let's begin today's journey with a couple of, of news stories. Where shall we begin? Going to India first, Dave, where there is a bur- Ferrari death mystery, and a woman occultist is the first person arrested in this death mystery. In the murder mystery of 11 members of the Batia family in Delhi's Burari area, the Delhi police on Friday arrested a woman occultist uh, in connection with the case. While the relatives are denying any occult angle, it seems prime suspect and one of the deceased Lalit Batia's mental disorder became the reason of the mass suicide. Till now, the crime branch and Delhi police have recovered CCTV footage and several documents that point out the possibility that it was Lalit Batia and his love for ghosts that turned into a gory incident. In the wake of the suicide of 11 members of a family at the residence in Delhi's Burari area, the Delhi police on Friday arrested a woman, a cultist. The mystery behind the suicide of 11 members of a family at the residence in Delhi's Burari area has not been solved yet. With every new detail, the Delhi police is coming across a new complication to unravel the reason behind the mass suicide. Reports suggested that it was Lalit Batia, the youngest son of Narayani Devi, who orchestrated the entire ritual in which he, along with 10 family members, lost their lives. It seems like it was Lalit Batia's hallucinations and his mental condition that was behind the mass suicide of the family. According to reports, the bodies of the family members were found hanging on the June 30th, uh, but the preparations of the alleged mass suicide have begun around 10 days ago. Recently, a CCTV footage that was obtained by the crime branch revealed that the family had bought the things to be used in the rituals a few days ago from a shop nearby their Burari residence. Uh, as per reports, they have found or they have bought five tables and bandages from a shop nearby their residence. Uh, during the investigation, the crime branch pointed out a possibility that it could be Lalit Batia and his wife Tina, who tied their uh, the hand of other family members. The whole purchasing took place at around 10:30 p.m. on June 30th. Reports also suggested that the family also rehearsed the suicide several times before actually committing it to make sure that nothing had gone wrong. Uh, The investigations further revealed that Lalit and his wife were seen purchasing some goods related to Vastu Shastra uh, between June 23rd and June 30th. After going through Lalit Batia's browsing history, the police revealed that he used to watch paranormal and ghost shows on the Internet. He was also researching the mystery of deaths and souls. He was last seen outside his home at the night of the incident, chaining family's pet dog. Boy, that's uh, kind of grim. There you go. Very grim. Yeah. Holy cow. But he was watching paranormal TV shows, which means automatically it's it's that, their fault, right? The paranormal shows. <laughs> that's what they're suggesting in this article. Yikes. All yeah. right, where's our next story taking us? Uh, next story is, uh, looks like again, over on the other side of the pond, ghost hunters visit a notorious, uh, notoriously haunted hotel. And what they discover is truly horrifying. Uh, terrifying footage has emerged of the moment paranormal investigators visited a hotel reportedly filled with ghosts and they were not disappointed. Bear and Wolf, both self-proclaimed ghost hunters with only one name like Madonna, traveled to, uh, Combe Abbey near Coventry. Uh, Video footage shows the moment they spotted a ghostly figure lurking in the window of the building on arrival, said to be a girl named Miranda. 
and another clip appears to show a spirit responding to their commands. The hotel and park used to be a Cistercian uh, monastery uh, built in the 1100s and is believed to be filled with countless spirits. Most of the bizarre activity in the abbey are ascribed to the ghost of Abbot Geoffrey, a monk who was murdered in 1345. Guests have reported seeing his figure uh, float around the hotel grounds. Paranormal experts believe the strange behavior around the hotel is caused by the monk venting his anger at being murdered. They are also convinced a girl called Matilda roams around the hotel in rags after dying during childbirth. Other spirits reported at the hotel include a ghostly horseman and a Victorian woman who stands at the roadside. Bears said, when we first arrived, we connected with the spirit of a young girl named Matilda. She was a stable hand when Combe Abbey was still a manor house. We picked up her presence. Uh, then we read the history afterwards when we had seen the footage, and the history didn't match what our medium gave us, which was that Matilda was actually sexually abused. We had full access to the manor house then, and there is a secret room on the fourth floor. My partner, Wolf, she picked up on a lot of pain when we were there. Uh, then in the window, when we were filming the outside of Combe, uh, we filmed a lady who was an apparition. Combe Abbey was a monastery for 500 years before the dissolution of the monasteries in 1536, when it became a private house. In 1964, Coventry City Council purchased Combe Abbey, and in 1992, no ordinary hotels purchased the house and turned it into a hotel and restaurant. Oh, that's a good place to eat and drink, knowing you've got a pissed off monk walking around screeching at you. Huh? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that happens at yes. most restaurants. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if I could order the cod and a nice bottle of uh, white wine. White wine? <laughs> Red wine is what goes with cod, you moron. Even from the other side, people know this. God, why don't you take me to the heaven? You think that's what it sounds like? I, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's actual audio, if I remember right. I mean, I, <laughs> I have to review my show notes, but I'm pretty sure that's... Your show notes? My show notes. It's so nice, Mr. Dennis, that you have show notes. I have show notes. Dear Dave and Tim, Tim and Dave, Dashing Dave, Tenacious Tim, read them any way you like. I had to send in an email to thank you for making me laugh out loud on my way to work listening to your parashare from the 23rd of June. Tumbling down the stairs, not the shirt, classic. Not the shirt when we were yelling, not the shirt, Tim. <laughs> not the shirt. Believe it, or, believe it or not, Tim, that mocking of other people's stories has inspired this listener to share their own story. Oh, really? It has inspired me to finally send you my most amazing paranormal experience to date. And please feel free to add as many sound effects and shtick to the story as you like. How dare you? I will Ooh. not bring my shtick out in public, Tim. A challenge. It's rather long, like my shtick, so uh -huh. hope I have broken it into paragraphs sufficiently enough for you. You have. I enjoy it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Around 10 to 12 years ago, a friend and I booked an overnight stay and ghost tour at what is advertised as Australia's most haunted house, Monte Cristo, in a little town called Juni in New South Wales. Big fan of the sandwich, by the way. Yeah. Oh, God. Dipping yeah. it in that jelly. Oh, yeah. sign me up. Mm -hmm. We arrived in the afternoon, and we were directed to choose which bedroom we wanted, as we were the first of the groups to arrive. The bedrooms were all in the old original building, which was where Reg and his wife had set up home. Once the main manor had been built by the original owners, the old building was mainly used for staff accommodation. We chose one of the middle bedrooms, which had an old wrought iron double bed in the middle of the room and a single bed under the window. We walked around the property a bit, which is quite large, with many buildings, and then gathered for a group dinner before we then went on the ghost hunt. During dinner, the owner, Reg, who has now sadly passed away, gave us a bit of history of the building. And, okay, I was just trying to wrap my head around how the dead guy gave me the history. <laughs> yeah, but I'm guessing yeah. at the time, Reg was still alive. Right. Okay, yeah. so, all right, so my mind just takes a few minutes, Tim. That's it's right. this buffering issue. Yeah. I'm still running on DSL or on uh, dial-up, and, uh, my, you know, the rest of the world oh, is on DSL here. Right, yeah. During dinner, the owner, who was still alive at the time, Reg, and has now since passed, 
gave us a bit of history of the building and how he and his wife had purchased it as a totally run-down, windowless, stairless shell when his wife was eight months pregnant and how they had worked very hard to bring it back to its historical glamour as it appeared today. The tour then started once the sun had gone down and was all done by candlelight, Tim. Oh, romantic. By candlelight. Obviously to add atmosphere and to enhance the spookiness. The main new house is four rooms downstairs and four rooms upstairs with a central grand stairway and a wraparound balcony. We entered via the front door, and as we went into each room, Reg gave us a bit of history of what the room was used for when they first bought it, then what the room had been restored to, such as a drawing room, dining room, kitchen, etc. We went through the first few rooms downstairs without incident, and then we were led into the fourth room, Tim. Not the fourth room. It's always the fourth room. Hmm. Reg was explaining that this room was initially set up by his wife and himself as the kitchen, and as he said... I felt the distinct feel of a cat rubbing itself against the back of my legs. Oh, my God. A cat against the back of my legs, Tim. Not the back. I looked down to see if there was a cat in the room, but there was no sign of one. Reg then went on to say that after a while, his wife had refused to come into that room when she was home alone as she kept hearing a cat mew and finding dead cats on the kitchen floor. Creepy, right? Unless you like dead cats. After his talk, Reg then said that we were all welcome to take photos and have a look around the room, and when we had finished to meet him upstairs in the first room on the left to the top of the stairs. As soon as we had finished speaking and started to walk away, I felt very distinctly a hand cup my elbow. You know like they used to do in the olden days as holding hands, was taboo. Uh, I looked around and no one was anywhere near close enough to have touched me. And feeling was still there. I turned to my friend and told her what I felt and said, well, I've obviously been invited upstairs, so I'll see you there. Okay, mental note, Tim. When in an old spooky dank castle, mm -hmm. simply cupping a woman's elbow, she will take the hint that it is time to go to the bedroom. Hell yeah. Good to note. Good to note. I don't even, maybe this isn't a woman. I didn't get to who's writing it yet, so I could be wrong. <laughs> Guy, you could grab us by the earlobe. We'll follow you into a bedroom in an old, dark, spooky place. Think we won't? Like, come on, Scoob. Let's go get it on. <laughs> we were then given a tour of the four main rooms upstairs, which were all bedrooms, Tim. Oh, uh, yeah. The first room, which is called the Blue Room, mm. apparently had a famous guest one night, Russell Crowey. Tim Crowey. I'm going to use I'm going to use the E if it's in there. Sure. Yeah. But can't remember if he had any experiences while he was there. Again, we were taken around three of the four rooms without incident, and then we were taken into the fourth bedroom. No. The fourth bedroom. Not the fourth. I just told you the goddamn fourth bedroom. Oh, How many times do I have to repeat it, Tim? Stop right, questioning sorry. me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. <clears throat> the first thing that struck my friend was that all the dolls were stacked up on the bed. No. She whispered to me that they look like dead children. Meow. First of all, how many <laughs> stacks of dead children bodies has your friend seen? Yeah, really. And if so, why that's, are you still hanging around with that friend? Convict. Just after that comment, Reg mentioned that his room had at one time been the room where abortions of the serving staff had taken place. Hmm. Insert shiver here. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them? How do they, do they pass that around? They're like, oh, yes. Um, uh, yes. Down here we have the kitchen and the dining room. That was the library. I could enjoy reading a good book. Upstairs we had a few of the servants' bedrooms. Oh, and the abortion room. Hmm. Very, very popular among the staff. <laughs> very. All of them hung out there at one time or another. How does, how does that get passed down through the legend? Wouldn't you, I don't know, wouldn't that be something you want to kind of hide? Yeah, it might be yeah. more, you know, 
Oh, Reg, delightful home. I can't wait to see everything. Coal mine, shaft, and oh, I do hope you have an abortion room. Well, if they're getting the shaft, they have to have an abortion room, don't they? I guess so. Mm. Yes. All right. Mm. I was one of the first to walk into the room, so I moved to the near back wall, partly behind the big brass bed. I stood with one leg straight and the other one slightly pointed out just to set the scene for you. Because that's a pretty important part right there, Tim. Yes. You're in fourth position, closing in on a plie. As Reg was talking, I felt a tap on the top of my foot. The one pointed out, and I looked down to see my shoe depress another two times. There's nothing worse than depressed shoes, Tim. Well, they're kind of sad. It was like someone was poking me to move my foot out of the way. So I did, apologizing to the thin air as I did so. Ghosts are so pokey. Moving on from the main house, we were then taken through the gardens on our way to the barn. As we were walking through, I mentioned to my friend that I could smell smoke and asked if she could smell it too. She said she couldn't, but I could smell it quite strongly and just figured it was someone with an open fire close by. When we got to the barn, we were then told the story of how one of the farmhands had reported to the farm manager that he wasn't feeling well that day and was too sick to get up to go to work. The farm manager didn't believe him and thought he was just trying to get out of work for the day. So the manager set the worker's bed pallet alight, and they, ma- they were made of straw. However, the worker really was too sick to get out of bed and was severely burnt and died from his injuries. Boy, that's, that's one way to push the old I think he's calling in sick routine, Tim. <laughs> Hey, I think old Bobbit over there is faking illness. Go set fire to his bed. Let's see how quickly his illness passes, <laughs> shall we, Tim? <laughs> it only takes a spark to get a fire going, Tim. The last place we were taken to prior to returning to the main house for a late night drink and then to bed was the main carriage house, which is also t- sometimes used as a ballroom, Tim. Hmm. Ballroom. I noticed a couple of cats walk into the room with us, as I believe that animals can sense things that we can't, and said to my friend that if I see any of the cats running out, I'm gone. When we went to bed, I told my friend I was happy to take the single bed so she could have the big double bed all to herself, thinking I was doing her a favor. I found out the next morning that wasn't the case. When we all went downstairs to breakfast, Reg asked us how we had slept, and my friend mentioned she didn't sleep well at all. She had a feeling of someone shaking her by the shoulder at one stage, as well as feeling that someone had sat or jumped on the end of the bed a couple of times. Reg smiled and mentioned that they often get reports of that form from that bedroom, the feeling like children are trying to wake you up to play. Guess it's not surprising that my friend has refused to stay overnight with me anywhere since. There are a lot of interesting facts and stories from Monte Cristo, as well as some intriguing photographs, so it is well worth a visit and an overnight stay if you're in the area. Thank you to Tim and yourself. Hmm. For what? I don't know, but you get the first thanking. Well, I appreciate so, it. Yeah. Big shot, Tim. Look Thanks. at me, everybody. I'm Tim. <laughs> Thank you to Tim and yourself for constantly <laughs> keeping me amused, informed, and entertained, especially you, Tim. Your honesty about issues that you have both dealt with in your lives and the strength that you have found from each other as well as others in your life are inspiring. During the parish share mentioned above on the 23rd of June, you also talked about the time when people pass. When my dad died from multiple cancers in 2013, the night he passed, my husband and I had taken my mom home with us to feed her a good meal as she had been eating hospital food while staying there with dad. Dad had been in a coma for the last couple of days, but as I left, I gave him a kiss on the forehead and whispered to him, I love you, Daddy. Later that night, after Mom had returned to the hospital, we received the call that Dad had passed. I was upset thinking that he died while we had taken Mom away, but he had held on until she returned and quietly passed not long after. I, too, believe that they know in some way. They just know. Hugs and love to you and yours, and that comes from Natalie Voyevich. Thank you, Natalie Voyevich. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Natalie. Thank you for sharing your story. All right, uh, shall I do another quick uh, quick little uh, sh- story here, Tim? Then we'll get back to another news, st- news tale. Yeah, please. Hi, Dave and Tim. Got a few short stories for you. One, I was seven years old. My mom sent me to the neighbor's house to get my older brother and bring him back to dinner. I had a tendency to be a brat punk. 
not just a brat or a punk, Tim, but a brat punk. Oh, yeah. And barge on into people's homes without knocking. So I walked into the neighbor's home. My older brother is hugging his girlfriend. Her parents are crying. I found out why. In the back room, my brother's girlfriend's grandfather was lying in a bed being given his last rites. The priest walked out and talked to the family. My older brother gave me a dead arm for walking into their home without knocking. I peered down into the old man's room and I kept staring because in the room surrounding the old man were humanoid shadows just waiting, staring at him and then at me. My brother then punched me again and said, let's go. He didn't see the figures. Second story. Years later, I'm 13 years old and we left Los Angeles for the San Gabriel Valley, California. It was evening and I went to relieve myself. Suddenly, the bathtub started making these creaking noises like a scraping. I looked over and out of the drain, this weird metallic form started coming up. Kind of like a small idol humanoid in shape but generic description i can come up with but still attached to a pipe like that garbage monster in star wars episode four i was kind of shocked and went over to the bathtub and it's there kind of looking around and i said hey effer this is private but that had no effect really calling the garbage monster a fucker had no effect (laughs) (laughs) i guess garbage monsters aren't affected by your garbage language you know no So I washed my hands, never taking my eyes off of it. And as I was walking out of the bathroom and my stepdad walked by, so I asked him to check out the bathtub. He gave me a sarcastic Spanish remark and walked over to the bathtub. He just stopped and stood there staring at this tube idol thing. He asked me, God, really? I got to try to speak Spanish here, Tim. Go ahead. K, Dimanos, S, S, O? (laughs) Or what the hell is that? I replied, fuck it if I know. Well, you are a potty mouth. Yeah, I'll say. He then went over to grab it. But just as he was about to touch it, Uh the scraping noises started and it shot back down the drain. So we were both stunned. He said, it's not there, your mom. (laughs) Of course, she heard us talking and asked what's going on. So I tell her nothing. Oh, so you're a potty mouth and you lie to your mother. Nice. Wow. We're just hanging out in the bathroom. Yeah, that's not weird. Mm. You and your stepfather hanging out in the bathroom as he's yelling, Hey, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) My stepdad wouldn't stop laughing at that point. Three years later, I'm in my 30s and married. My wife, kids, and I are living in Apple Valley, California. Mm. We put the boys to bed. I poured some wine, and I'm trying to be smooth, cha-cha my wife, Uh for some alone time. Uh Uh-huh. How do you, my best to smooth cha-cha my wife. Well, smooth cha-cha, it's a, it's a little move, you know. Sounds like a nice cologne from the 70s. <laughs> Tim, you smell refreshing after today's squash match. Are you wearing smooth cha-cha? <laughs> so he goes into the kitchen to get some strawberries. When she started screaming hysterically, I ran over. She's freaking out. Both of our dogs are crying and soiling the corner of the kitchen. Uh-oh. My boys are awoken. I asked her if my dancing was really that bad, and she told me to shut up. There was a giant upright dog outside in the backyard. She described it as if it was standing upright on two legs, staring at her through the window. Taller than my six foot three self, but the head and face of a wolf dog. So I grabbed my knife and went into the yard where there was nothing. Hmm. The boys refused to go out with me. Of course. Well, I would hope so, yeah. dumbass. It's bigger than you and you're six foot three. Yeah, there and you you've go. got a knife. Yeah. These boys, they are a disappointment to me. All they do is stand there weeping. I need to kill this beast quickly so that I can get my smooth cha-cha back on. <laughs> they kept crying in the house, but there was nothing out there. She swears up and down. She saw a giant dog type creature. Well, I hope you guys have a great week. And that comes from Eduardo, the smooth operator, Tim. So you can do the accent, but you're not going to do the uh, language, huh? Hey, es esto bueno mi amigo. <laughs> Which loosely translates to kiss my ass, my friend. <laughs> I'm trying to put the smooth cha cha on my wife. <laughs> I always get bumps when I try to get a smooth, a smooth cha-cha. I don't know yeah, about you. That well, razor burns a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm, I'm a very hairy, but I do get the uh, bumps. Yeah. You too, my friend? Yes. We are all facing the hairy bumps, if you know what I'm talking uh, about, my friend. Oh, uh, yes. A little aqua velvo take it right away, though. 
Where are we going next in the world of supernatural news, Tim? We're talking Slender Man, Dave, and a new documentary that gets to the heart of the Internet Boogeyman. On December 21st of 2017, a Wisconsin judge sentenced 15-year-old Anissa Wire uh, to the uh, 25 years in a mental institution for the crime of stabbing her friend 19 times in the chest. I guess, I guess it's Weir. Uh, was only 12 years old when she attempted the murder. Her motivation for the crime had a name, and that name was Slender Man. Uh, Weir spent the months leading up to the attack poking around on uh, Creepy Pasta, the hub for paranormal stories and user-generated legends. There she discovered stories of the faceless, tentacled entity known as Slender Man, known for luring children into the forest, according to Melissa Westendorf, the psychologist appointed by the court to evalu- evaluate the defendant. Weir and her friend Morgan Geyser, also convicted for the crime, soaked up the Slender Man mythos like sponges and lost their grasp on what was and wasn't real. Featuring that creature could come... For their families, the girls led a third girl from their class into the woods in order to end her life in ritualistic fashion. Westendorf's testimony suggested that Weir uh, knew that her mind was succumbing to delusion early on in her creepypasta diet. She wondered aloud to her father, how can my brain let me do this? Dan Schoenbrunn's startling new archival documentary, A Self-Induced Hallucination, confronts the murder case, a subsequent trial, and cultural shadow of Slender Man, but it's not a true crime investigation or even a history of the character's story. If you're looking for that, HBO has you covered with the 2017 film Beware the Slender Man. Instead, using clips culled from the depths of, the, of YouTube, hallucination dissects a collective consciousness born from the primitive internet use that warped with the help of a uh, modern horror icon into something akin to religion. At first, I considered the film to be a work of media criticism, and it is, wrote Schoenbrunn in his director's statement, but I've since come to understand the film best as a work of theological inquiry. I've always thought of, an, of art as a form of secular worship, and this was a film made during a crisis of faith. The clips include in a self-induced hallucination range from news broadcasts to Slender Man explainers to myth-debunking rants to whispered confessionals where the yarn-spinning tactics of creepypasta shroud themselves in YouTube's most potent genre to become miniature Blair Witch videos. There's a bloody-nosed kid pretending to suffer from slender sickness. There's a paranormal investigator who knows Slender Man is an internet creation yet still believes there's something out there in the woods to find. There's a couple whose relationship is withering away, and Slender Man's videos may be the poison, and they're all staged. But it's unclear if they're all fiction, as Schoenbrunn makes it clear in an anecdote from his Making of essay. He says, I recall a typo-laden forum post I came across one night, written in the first person by a young girl haunted by the Slender Man, in which she detailed her habit of stealing pills from her parents' medicine cabinet to cope with her parents' divorce. Was this a complete fabrication or a genuine cry for help? In A Self-Induced Hallucination, a YouTube talking head broaches the subject of the tulpa, the mystical Buddhist concept of one's ability to manifest a physical being or object through concentrated thought. With wary eyes, the fragile young man from a conservative Christian family details the creation of his own spiritual telekinetic companion, who he says saved his life during a suicide attempt. The idea is that maybe, despite the product of a something awful Photoshop contest, one or more internet persons brought the fabricated Slender Man to life as a tulpa, or to use the translated Tibetan Book of the Dead's term, a thought form, after not or after being not real, it could be real right now. Schoenbrunn, through the juxtaposition of mixed media, proves the theory that Slender Man is real, a digital tulpa who has burrowed his way into the psychology of a certain sect of internet users, and achieved a level of godliness that can provoke violence in the real world. The same way a harmless comic character like Pepe the Frog uh, can become radicalized into an emblem of alt-right movement through aggressive uh, memification, so too can the ghastly force of a forum ghost story be summoned like Candyman through the repeated utterance of his name. Slenderman is a viral demon that the human brain is prone to perpetuate. Schoenbrunn sifted through hundreds of videos to construct 
a self-induced hallucination, the result skims the surface of what's out there, but what he's found will send a shiver down your spine. All right. Uh, Slender Man, man, I don't know. There's so many weird things with this story, and it just keeps getting weirder. I'm, I'm interested to see that movie when it comes out. Are, are you looking forward to that? Yeah, it looks like it could be interesting, that's for sure. All right, where are we off to next? Well, an ex-NASA scientist claims that aliens exist, but the government is covering up encounters, according to this article. A former NASA research scientist has claimed that aliens exist, but many governments have covered up extraterrestrial encounters. Kevin Knuth, or, yeah, Kevin Knuth, uh, who is now a professor of physics at the University of Albany, believes there is plenty of evidence to support the existence of UFOs in our universe. The former NASA worker says humanity needs to face the possibility that UFO sightings may be visitors from afar and insists more research needs to be done on the topic as it would benefit mankind. The confession comes the day before UFO Day, which has been observed every year on July 2nd since the holiday's inception by UFO hunter uh, Hockton Actigan. Act again. Yeah, there you go. In 2001, the existence of UFOs and other extraterrestrial travelers is a fiercely debated topic among so-called alien truther and scientists alike. Writing for the uh, conversation, which must be a publication, Mr. Knuth said, "I believe we need. I believe we need the or to face the possibility that some of the strange flying objects that outperform the best aircraft in our inventory." and defy explanation may indeed be visitors from afar, and there's plenty of evidence to support UFO sightings. Knuth believes talking about UFOs is taboo, which has prevented any proper scientific study into the topic and blames governments and the media for the skepticism that surrounds extraterrestrial study. He added, essentially we are told that the topic is nonsense. UFOs are off-limits to serious scientific study and rational discussion, which unfortunately leaves the topic in the domain of fringe and pseudoscientists, many of whom litter the field with conspiracy theories and wild speculation. Brazil, Canada, Denmark, Ecuador, France, New Zealand, Sweden, Russia, and the UK have been declassifying UFO files for the past decade, and Knuth says UFO sightings from government officials lends legitimacy to the uh, claims. He points towards the Committee D <laughs> Committee D Estudios de Fenomenos Arios Anomalos, the C E F A A, which was formed You're by the, fun of my Spanish. Well, I'm I'm I'd never Ay, claimed. Ay, caramba! It was formed by the Chilean government and the, well, the French CEFAA, which I don't speak French, so there you go, uh, made up of scientists and military officials as organizations that provide evidence uh, towards the existence of aliens. Knuth also discusses the Fermi paradox, uh, which uh, the question of why we have never had or never heard anything from other civilizations, despite the vastness of space, almost guaranteeing the existence of extraterrestrial life. He said it is highly likely that aliens are real and that a large number of the 300 billion stars in our galaxy are able to host hospitable planets. The problem is that there has been no single well-documented UFO encounter that would alone qualify as a smoking gun, he said. The situation is exacerbated by the fact that many governments around the world have covered up and classified information about such encounters. He argues that scientific evidence-based knowledge of the topic would greatly benefit mankind as it could develop technology and knowledge and help us understand our place in the universe. Just last week, a flying saucer-like UFO was spotted above the famous Nazca lines in Peru. There you go. All right, and another story before we go to break? Sure. Uh, This one has to do with... uh, TV series that wasn't around all that long. Unfortunately, another paranormal sitcom bites the dust. We're talking about Ghosted over on Fox. Mm -hmm. Ghosted is busted at Fox. The half-hour sitcom started off its freshman season as the number two comedy on TV, trailing just behind CBS's Young Sheldon, but it looks like, though it's it's supernatural, might couldn't hold up. There you go. Initially, Fox only ordered 10 episodes, but after a strong start, it ordered six more. Now it appears as though not all of those will see the light of day or the dark of night, either way. Created by Tom Gormican, the series was billed as a comedic twist on the X-Files and starred 
Park and Recreation's Adam Scott and the office's Craig Robinson, as well as uh, Adil Akhtar, Ali Walker, and Amber Stevens-West as paranormal investigators. Things hit a snag halfway through the first season with showrunner Kevin Etten leaving the series and replaced by Paul Lieberstein, uh, also from The Office, uh, reportedly because Fox wanted to shift the program to more of a workplace comedy format. It doesn't appear that the change worked out all that well. Fox has been burning off the Lieberstein overseen episodes this summer, basically the TV equivalent of going out of business sale. Only five of the episodes were aired, but Ghosted has been yanked, and it's unclear if the final three episodes will ever air on the network. The option on the cast expires this weekend, so the network had to make a decision. This now means that Fox has no established live-action comedies returning for the new fall season. It's really unclear what went wrong for Ghosted. It started off pretty strongly, but when Fox removed it from its schedule to retool it, it seems that the enthusiasm waned. Bringing it back in the dead of summer certainly didn't help the series. This fall, Fox is shifting its focus away from original programming towards sports and sports entertainment. Having just signed a five-year deal with the NFL for Thursday Night Football, it's deal to split UFC with ESPN and taking over WWE SmackDown Live in October. So there you go. Uh, yeah, they, they have a tendency of canceling shows a little too prematurely and then keeping other shows on forever. Yeah. Yep. Way too long. Um, I, you know, I didn't like Ghosted. I tried to watch it, and I like both of those guys. I just couldn't get into the show. Yeah, I tried. And a I've been waiting for a good too. paranormal comedy, and and yeah. I guess I'm still waiting. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched a couple episodes, and it didn't really thrill me, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, here's something that'll thrill you, though. Now you can be a part of our show on a weekly basis. But how you say, well, shut up and let me tell you how. Stop interrupting me. <laughs> you can call the Beyond the Darkness voicemail and leave messages for Dave and Tim. We'll play them in the episodes on Saturday. If you have a paranormal encounter story and you're tired of hearing Tim and I read these stories, you can share your own story by calling the Beyond voicemail. 651 300 Four nine seven seven six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven. If you want to share your paranormal encounters or just talk sexy to Tim, either way, it's <laughs> never been easier to reach out and touch someone as you can touch your buddies on Beyond the Darkness. What? Feel free to start off by touching Tim. Yeah. He likes it better than I do. Well, I Beyond do. the Darkness voicemail six five one three hundred four nine seven seven. Leave us your voicemails, your thoughts on the show. If you uh, have insights. If you uh, would even like to make comments about guests that you've heard on the show and your thoughts on those topics, we may play them in an upcoming episode. And by leaving these voicemails, understand that they become part of our show. We own them in perpetuity. We will make millions and millions of pennies off of them and share nothing with you. But if you do want to share your paranormal encounters with us, it'll be great. And we would enjoy hearing them and sharing them on the live shows here on Saturday. So call 651-300-4977. Should I repeat that number one more time, Tim? Please. 651-300-4977. That's the Beyond the Darkness voicemail to reach out to the boys and be a part of the show. Hi, Dave. Ooh, rough start right there. I love it when you're on Coast to Coast. Another rough start. You talk about more, more about ghosts than George does, and it's much more interesting. Well, I'm no longer doing Coast to Coast AM. I've parted ways with Coast to Coast on a positive way. I've, I just don't have enough time now doing Midnight in the Desert five days a week, doing Beyond the Darkness Saturdays and Sundays, True Crime Tuesdays on uh, Tuesdays. And Tim and I work every other day at the Sugar Shack as part of the Chunk and Dale Dancers. Oh, yeah. So we really have no more time to ourselves. Yep. So if you want to pour some sugar on me, make sure to head on out to the Sugar Shack and see the Chunk and Dale Dancers. I said, well, I, suddenly my voice sounds more and more like I've been drinking, uh, you know, bourbon all day and smoking a six pack, Tim. Smoking a six pack. <laughs> smoking, smoking a, a six pack. pack. That just tells you how uh, white bread I am. I don't even know what I'm That's, talking about when it comes to this. That's talent. Hi, Dave. I had a real life experience with orbs uh -oh. way back in 1978 or so. It was after dark and I happened to look out the window of my third floor apartment in Linwood, Washington. I noticed some movement below and saw what looked like glowing balls of light on an invisible string that were spiraling and moving about above the lawn. This was the most amazing sight, and it chilled me so much that I quickly shut the curtains. It was as if these ghostly balls of light were a living creature, and I was afraid it would notice me and fly up through the window and do who knows what, Tim. Mm. Yeah, you don't want them to get their big ghostly balls all over you. Right. I know this sounds crazy, but I wasn't drunk or high. You're right. It does sound crazy that you weren't drunk or high. <laughs> What's wrong with you? It was a night to have fun. Right. 
but I was just getting ready to go to bed on a typical weeknight before going back to work the next day. It reminded me almost of a small animal playing around the lawn, except that this was flying just above the lawn and was made of a translucent glowing balls of white light. I decided to open the curtains and take another look. I was certain this must have been my imagination. Upon pulling back the curtains and peeking cautiously out, I once again saw the glowing string of lights cavorting around above the lawn. This really terrified me because I'd never seen anything like this before and have never seen it again. Back then, I had never really heard of orbs or anything like it. I never spoke about what I'd seen for many years until I started hearing about orbs on Coast to Coast back when Art Bell had the show. I've only mentioned this occurrence to my husband and a few family members because most people would think I'm nuts. I'm positive of what I saw that night, but have no idea what it was. Now, I wish I could have been brave enough to go outside and investigate it, but I was alone at the time and just a little too terrified. Sincerely, Carol Green. I can't blame you, Carol. As a single woman, you don't want to be out in the yard getting ghost balls all over you. It's hard to get those stains out of your uh, clothes, Tim. (laughs) It's true, it is, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? I'm in a giving mood, Tim. How about one more quick story? All right. Are you ready for this? Ready. Are you ready for this? Ding, 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 ding. That was a little musical interlude, Tim, as I'm trying to find a, a shorter story to share. I see. And that, that that's not it either. Hmm. That's uh, I thought I had a couple of short stories lined up, and most of them are, are quite long tonight. So hmm. I don't know uh, that I've got another one to, to throw in your general direction before a break. So let's just go ahead and take a quick break. We'll come back. I've got more stories to share, more news right here on Supernatural News and a Parish Share Saturday. I'm Dave, that's Tim, and this is Beyond the Darkness. Hello, welcome back to the show. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Make sure you're here with us tomorrow. Garrett Duncan is our guest. He is a Native American with the Navajo tribe and Navajo Illuminati, I think it's called, right, Tim or something? Or Illuminations, that's what Illuminations, it is. Illuminations, yes. And uh, not, not the Navajo not, Illuminati. Not the Illuminati. No, no. The Navajo Illuminations. And he is here to talk to us about Sasquatch and um, this star language. And it, it, this show took us both by surprise, all three of us, actually. Because at one point, during the interview, he sensed that near him was one of the elders of the forest people, uh, spirits, and began channeling this spirit to us. And um, we also spoke to what we believe might be uh, alien uh, presence. And it's a fascinating episode. I mean, it's certainly one of those that's a head scratcher and was not what we were expecting, but I thoroughly enjoyed uh, doing that episode. And I I hope our listeners will enjoy it as much. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, so make sure you check that out tomorrow. Come with an open mind. Throw down all your preconceived notions. Remember, this is the kind of show you guys are begging for. You want the odd, you want the strange tomorrow. We bring it in spades, and the possibilities are limitless. And remember, you can be a part of the show now. Call in the Beyond the Darkness voicemail, 651-300-4977. 651-300-4977 to be a part of the program. And we will play your audio bits on upcoming episodes of Beyond the Darkness. Tim, where shall we go next in the world of supernatural news? Zimbabwe, Dave. Really? I don't think I'm dressed for it, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> a talking cow is troubling a family. You heard me right. It's not Mr. Ed, it's uh, Mr. Z. A talking cow? Yeah, talking, uh-huh. talking cow. In a truly strange case out of Zimbabwe, a village chief has been enlisted to help a family who says that one of their cows has suddenly begun to talk. Uh, the bizarre case began last month when Chief Zamunia was, uh, you got some on Zamunia, uh, was uh, informed of the weirdness by members of the family who were troubled by what they were hearing from the creature. This is a true story of a cow that talks, speaking fluently, he told a, media, a local media outlet. I have never hey, heard. Hey, close the door. I'm the only one here born in a barn. 
<laughs> you guys get it? I'm a cow. I'm born in a barn. The actual audio from Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. I have never heard of a talking cow, but this one is really speaking, speaking our mother language, the chief went on to say. According to Zamunya, the uh, cow in question is not only talking, but airing its grievances against the family. Yep. Good God, can you get a shovel out here? It smells like cow ass. <laughs> cow ass, I said. Can you, can you smell it in there? Because I can smell it out here. Evidently, the cow sounds like Mr. Magoo. <laughs> Specifically, the chatty creature has been known to complain about being fed late, not having enough water to drink. Mm-hmm. Amazingly, the cow is also... He's going to throw a little Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid in his trough. This water tastes rank. A little Kool-Aid, some red Kool-Aid, that's all I'm asking. Amazingly, the cow is also said to have criticized the family's choice of land that is used for the cows to graze and argues that the pastures provided to the livestock do not yield sufficient food for the animals. Oh. Yeah. Are you... Are you sure this is sunblock you're rubbing on? It smells like barbecue sauce. What are you doing? I'm starting to get the feel you guys don't like me around here much. Cows are regular Norma Ray. Hmm. Yeah. Rather than rejoice in the fact that there's uh, somehow that they somehow now own a talking cow, the family has apparently gotten tired of the creature's constant grumbling. I sense hamburger in their it's future. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You're like, how great would it be if our cow started talking? Hey! Hey, dipshit! <laughs> I need some yogurt out here. My tummy's rumbling. <laughs> yes, get, like the cow is eating talking, yogurt. You get a talking cow who's just like an annoying asshole. <laughs> <laughs> As such, they've asked Zamunia to determine how it acquired the ability to speak, and more importantly, what can be done to stop it. Uh, for his part, the chief believes he knows the cause of the creature's newfound ability, witchcraft. Of course. Couldn't have anything to do with, uh, I don't know, Rosetta Stone. Uh, someone in the family played with black magic for business enhancement, and the chickens are now coming home to roost, he declared. Pretty soon the chickens will know how to talk, too. However, solving the case has proven to be more difficult than Zamunia might have imagined, he initially called for the family to bring the cow to court last weekend. You heard that right, so that traditional healers could examine the animal. After... Is it going to be Perry Moosen? Oh, no. You didn't. Dun dun dun. Dun 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 dun. Yeah. Mootlock? Mootlock, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mootlock. See? Mm-hmm. Mootlock. I <laughs> kill me. And guess where they were going? The people's where? court. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Courtyard. The people's courtyard, Tim. You missed yeah, the joke. I Damn did, it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. After rituals are done, uh, the cause of the, all this will come out, he explained, and those implicated will appease what uh, whatever spirit would be demanding compensation. Alas, when the time came for the cow to appear in court, it was a no-show, much to the dismay of numerous villagers who attended uh, the hearing, hoping to see the fantastic talking creature in the flesh. He was b- busy at home watching a movie, Tim. Oh, no. No. No, you didn't. No. A movie, Tim. Yeah, I, I, I get that double feature. Oh, yeah. So Munya has uh, since issued an arrest order for a member of the family believed to have been behind the black magic, which set off the chain of events. It resulted in a cow being able to talk. When that individual is apprehended, the chief hopes that the case will finally be settled once and for all. Meanwhile, the mediator has other odd matters to attend to, as incredibly, he also happens to be the same official who is presiding over the case of the killer jacket, recently blamed for the deaths of 20 people. It's busy there in Zimbabwe, David. It's, It's very busy. I think I gave you that story, too, the cursed jacket story. Why don't we roll right into that one? Uh, yes, the cursed jacket. Here we go. Okay, so the cursed jacket Dave is talking about is killed 20. A family in Zimbabwe says that a jacket purportedly possessed by the spirit of a murder victim has wreaked havoc on the lives and amassed an astounding body count. According to a local media report, the strangeness surrounding the cursed clothing began with a man named Mutsi Yabako. 
I can say that 10 times fast, if you'd like, who had uh, killed someone in the late 1990s. He was subsequently tormented by the spirit of a man he had murdered and tried to put an end to the anguish by performing underworld rituals with, for some strange reason, a jacket as a centerpiece to the ceremony. It would appear that whatever he did uh, must have worked as a spirit seemingly got stuck in the jacket, which Mutsi Yabako uh, then gave to his brother. This gift turned out to be rather sinister right from the start as he died under strange circumstances shortly after receiving the jacket. The unknowingly cursed clothing uh, was kept over the next two decades, and as time went on, more and more members of the family mysteriously died. The alleged evil nature of the jacket recently came to light when, amazingly, a child in the family became possessed by the man who would, who would have been her grandfather and just so happened to be the first victim of the curse. The spirit then revealed the bizarre backstory of the jacket, which led the family to consult a witch doctor who could help them break this spell once and for all. The sorcerer appeared, apparently confirmed the channeled message and told Mutsi Abako that he must destroy the jacket that had caused what the family claims to be an astounding 20 deaths in total. Perhaps thinking of his own self-preservation, Mutsi Abako promptly disappeared without following the witch doctor's instruction, left with a cursed jacket that threatened to take more lives. Uh, the family turned to local authorities for help resolving the situation, and a warrant was put out for Mutsi Abako's arrest uh, so that he could answer the, for the mess that he had created. And there you thought there was drama in your family over unwanted hand-me-downs. That mm -hmm. cursed jacket has killed 20. Where are we going next, sir, in the world of supernatural news? We head to New York, Dave, where Sasquatch has been... Dun, 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 dun. Uh, it's in this country, Dave. Yeah, New, York. New York's name? No, it's no. The, the city of brotherly love? Yeah. The windy city, old New York? Too? No, 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 no. Yep. No. Yeah. The city that never sleeps? Well, Las yeah. Las Vegas. Right? No, no. No? No. no. N New York? New York, Dave. The, the state. New York, New York, it's a wonderful town. The Bronx is up and the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York. <laughs> <laughs> What's it's the, a wonderful town. It's, it's the state of New York, Dave. But th th oh, this is state. this is a village. I, and, I thought New York is a state of mind. Well, it is a state of mind, Dave. But this okay. is upstate New York. We're, we're going, no. we're going upstate. So it's up your state of mind, is what you're telling me. No, I'm not telling anybody to put anything up their state of mind. No, no. Okay. Um, this is a community in upstate New York, and they have a history of Bigfoot sightings, and they've declared the cryptid their official animal, Dave. It's the village of Whitehall. Okay. Not Wisconsin. Let's hear it. But the village of Whitehall, New York, has long been associated with Sasquatch thanks to a prominent 1976 sighting that led to numerous people coming forward to also say that they had seen the creature. Since that time, Bigfoot has become something of a mascot for the town, with several statues of the creature placed throughout the community, as well as an annual road race and festival centered around the Sasquatch theme. And now administrators in the village have taken things even further by recognizing Bigfoot as Whitehall's official animal. That's right, he's an animal. The resolution passed unanimously late last month with one voting member of the village board musing to a local newspaper that can't hurt. <laughs> Why not? Along with the official animal designation, the bill also declared that the last Saturday of September shall be henceforth known as Sasquatch Appreciation Day. Remarkably, this is not the first time that Sasquatch has been the subject of official town business as administrators had previously passed a law declaring the creature an endangered species. By way of this new designation, Whitehall joins a surprisingly long list of communities that have embraced Bigfoot, among them the cities of Jefferson, Texas and Evergreen, Alabama, uh, which have both declared themselves as the Bigfoot capital of their respective states, not to be Outdone, the town of Reamer, Minnesota, that's right, has laid claim to simply being the home of Bigfoot. That's right, we, we laid claim right here in Minnesota, Dave, to being the home of Bigfoot. Meanwhile, Washington State still has a bill waiting to be passed, which would designate Sasquatch as their official cryptid. There you go. Well, congratulations to them. Yeah. Good news. All right, do we have any other fun Animal stories, Tim. God, I love animal stories. A nice, loving, heartwarming animal story or two to wrap up this segment would be great. Um, I don't know about loving, Dave. I don't know about uh, 
I don't know about good news. Uh, if you're a psych- come on, Tim, warm the cockles of my heart. What's our what animal stories? Always, Tim, they bring out joy. They bring out happiness to people. They mm. love to hear an animal story, a yeah. silly animal story, a mm-hmm. fun animal story. That and what we've got psychic cats and psychic octopuses. Yeah. What could go wrong? Uh, death, <laughs> death could go wrong, Dave. It's not. Uh, it's not a fun time to be a psychic animal. It's just not. Not good. Not good at all. Dave, uh, a psychic World Cup cat has died this week. It's uh, it's not a fun time to be a psychic animal. A Chinese cat that had uh, become a national ce- celebrity by way of his uh, World Cup predictions has become the second uh, second psychic animal to die since the tournament began last month. Dave, we're calling it a rash. We're calling it an outbreak. We're calling it uh, we're calling it like we see it, Dave. According to reports out of China, the stray feline dubbed by Dianer, by Dianer, by Dianer, mm-hmm. uh, had been known to live near a gate at the palace complex known as a Forbidden City. It was something of an unorthodox pet of workers at the uh, site. At the start of this year's World Cup, uh, the cat was enlisted to predict the winners and at one point managed to foresee the correct results six times in a row. A very psychic cat, Dave. Uh, by Dianer's uh, remarkable run led to the clairvoyant creature garnering a huge following on Chinese social media, where apparently, much like in America, cats are pretty popular. However, fans of the feline were soon dealt some difficult news as it was revealed that the psychic cat had fallen ill. And in just a few days, handful of days later, by Dianer's uh, had uh, passed away, which prompted thousands of his fans to send their condolences to the cat's social media account. That's right. The psychic cat had a social media account. Uh, one can't help but notice that by Diner uh, and uh, his death follows the passing of, is it Rabiat? Rabiat? Which was the octopus we'll talk about in a minute. That's right. There's been a string of deaths, Dave. Death to all psychic animals. Oh my God, is there a serial psychic animal murderer out there? I think so. Yeah. It's uh, Yak the Ripper. <laughs> Uh, Ra- Rabiat or Ra- Rabiat was an octopus in Japan that also had become famous for its World Cup predictions. Although the mollusk's demise was due to his owner deciding to sell the creature to a fish market, we'll get to that in a second. What? Yeah, all right, we'll yeah, get to, yeah. all right. Get back to the death of the psychic cat. Right. So the uh, Chinese feline. The, the trend is somewhat troubling. Is it? conjures concerns that perhaps there's some kind of curse at work here, Dave. That's what they're they're speculating. But with that in mind, and considering the old adage that these things happen in threes, we sincerely hope that someone was keeping a close eye on the mystic Marcus, the clairvoyant pig from England. There's no whereabouts so far on mystic Marcus. I'm just saying. Good God. All right. What's our next sad serial killer, psychic monster animal well, story? I did mention the psychic octopus. <clears throat> well, one would think that boasting a perfect record for World Cup predictions would afford some measure of protection for a psychic animal, Dave. That was apparently not the case for one unlucky octopus in Japan who wound up being eaten. Rest in peace. The clairvoyant creature known as Rabiat was uh, riding high after correctly predicting the outcomes of all three of Japan's group stage games in this year's tournament. This was particularly remarkable because the country had a win, a loss, and a tie in those three games, suggesting that perhaps Rabiat uh, had some genuine psychic skills. Psychic octopus, Dave, which is delicious deep fried. Just saying. As one can imagine, the octopus's feet garnered the attention of the Japanese media who celebrated the creature's surprising success. However... It has now been revealed that Rabiot's 15 minutes of fame has come down to about 10 to 15 minutes in oil. And it's a little bit of light breading. I mean, it's it's tasty. Uh, And has come to a gruesome, some might say delicious end. Very, very tasty. I don't know if you've had octopus, Dave, but it's a little rubbery. Not not psychic octopus. Do you absorb some of its powers if you eat uh, psychic octopus? I think so, yes. I think that's what happens. Uh, after images of the creature hanging in a fish market began circulating online, his owner stepped forward to confirm that indeed Rabiot was no more. Uh, although he expressed appreciation for the animal's possible psychic abilities, Kimio Abe, a, a fisherman by trade, 
explained that uh, he had to put his business first and, as such, sold the animal to a local market. You, you bastard. His now former owner hopes that the uh, legacy of the clairvoyant turned calamari uh, can continue by way of a successor psychic octopus. He said, I hope that the second Rabiat uh, will also give the outcomes correctly and that Japan will go all the way, he declared. <laughs> What a cold, unfeeling bastard. Uh, We'd say that the new octopus's life might depend on it, but based on the original Rabiot's fate, it seems that the ultimate outcome for his understudy is a foregone conclusion. Let's just hope he doesn't see it coming. Well, obviously he didn't, or he would have skeedaddled out of there. All right, uh, what's your next story for us? Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Well, we can go to the heavily armed ghost hunter who is busted. Yes, we can. Let's do it. Let's do it. Authorities in Pennsylvania arrested an aspiring ghost hunter who tried to break into a notoriously haunted house while armed with a rather odd arsenal of weapons, Dave. They say don't go in unarmed, I guess. I've never heard that rule like ghost hunting, but why not? According to a local news report, Anthony Parker was spotted prying pieces of plywood off of the boarded-up back door of an abandoned home known as the Wells House in the city of Wilkesbury. Uh, The 19th century abode is said to be the home of a number of spirits and has been heralded as one of Pennsylvania's most haunted locations. However, it is that reputation which drew him to the property as he told police that he was there to look for ghosts. The building is not currently open to the public for ghost hunting tours, and unfortunately, in his enthusiasm for paranormal investigating, Parker failed to get the proper permission to visit the site from the property manager, which is what prompted the initial call to police. He subsequently wound up in even bigger trouble when they saw that or what he had thought or what he had brought with him for the ghost hunt and what he thought was smart. Uh, A search of Parker produced an astounding assortment of weapons, including, get this, a two foot long sword, a knife, a shotgun and a pair of brass knuckles that also sported a blade. Alas, Parker did not explain to police why he thought he needed all of these weapons and how he or how they thought, or how they could possibly protect him should he encounter an apparition. Uh, To his credit, he was also armed with a Bible, which is probably the only piece of equipment that could have proven useful in the event that he met up with an angry spirit. All of this is moot, of course, since Parker never made it into the house and instead was taken downtown where he was booked on numerous charges related to his paranormal misadventure. All right, and uh, let's wrap it up. One more story, and then I've got a couple of uh, supernatural parishers to share before we round out our day. Well, Dave, I gotta, I gotta go with this one. A uh, hiker has found an odd tree out there, Dave. A very odd tree, in, indeed. Uh, while exploring a state forest in Massachusetts, a hiker stumbled upon a rather bizarre scene. And Dave, this could be anything. Uh, it may be even gruesome, but it was a tree covered in Elmo dolls. Oh, um, I think they were what? Sl- they were slaughtered. I-, I think, yeah, just it was a macabre scene of Elmo dolls, Dave, all over this tree. Uh, Julie Sylvia uh, was hiking with a friend in the Miles Standish State Forest over the weekend when they spotted the weird tree. Some of them were just regular Elmos, she told the radio station, Fun 107. But some of them were the Tickle Me Elmo kind, and quite a bit of them still had batteries in them. Oh, how grotesque. Although a tree covered in Elmo dolls is, <laughs> is still a bit unsettling, Sylvia said that there was no indication that it was some kind of memorial, so they weren't particularly unnerved by the find. In fact... The pair was more concerned with the fact that it was blistering 90 degrees that day, and as such, they simply snapped a few pictures of the oddity and kept hiking. We were like, whatever, it's just a bunch of Elmos, she recalled. Just a bunch of Elmos, oh, Sylvia. When Sylvia got home, she attempted to determine the origins of the Elmo tree, but soon realized that it was still quite the mystery. A post on a Facebook page for Plymouth residents revealed that most people had no idea the tree even existed, And it seems that nobody knows who created it or why. Attempts to connect the tree to two different murders that occurred in the area proved to be a dead end as the unfortunate victims were killed before Elmo became the worldwide sensation that he is today. 
Since the tree is located somewhat off the trail and about six miles deep in the forest, Sylvia theorized that the weird collection of Elmo dolls was meant to be discovered by hikers and possibly give them a scare. And while that may not have occurred in this particular instance, we're guessing that other hikers who happened upon the tree were less strenuous under were during less strenuous circumstances probably found it more than a little off putting. I I just think the yeah, think. the Elmos just grow naturally there, Dave. I think it's a it's a naturally the Elmo harvest tree. Yeah, it's a natural occurrence there, uh, uh. the Elmo tree. Yeah. Oh Elmo bomb, oh Elmo bomb, you're freaking me out today. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be out strolling in the woods, and there's just a tree wrapped in freaking Elmos. It, it looks freaking Elmos. My voice is disappearing. Damn my. I feel like you're becoming an old man. I think it looks rather serene, <clears throat> actually. Does it? Yeah, it's just. You'd like to just go out and read a book and do a little smooth cha cha. A little smooth cha cha all over those Elmos, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I okay. Mean, sure, it's all, all right. All right, let's try to wrap up with a couple of stories here. <clears throat> okay. Are we ready? Ready. Are you ready for this? Ready for this. All right. First off, I would like to thank you for taking the time to read my story. I come across this inquiry via Va- Vac Zaggins. Zach Vac... This is from God, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I came across this inquiry via Zach Baggins' Twitter account. I would like to state before I begin that I have numerous stories about the entity that decided to attach itself to me for 10 years. Many of the stories are of small occurrences, but I would like to mention to you some of these main ones that have happened to me. I have since been cleansed of this entity as of February 2016. It wasn't as if I had randomly noticed that I had something attached to me. It all began when I was in high school, and I made such the smart decision to play with a Ouija board. A friend at the time had just recently moved out of her home, so we thought it would be the perfect place to conduct a Ouija board session. The home was old, and according to my friend, it was haunted, which made it even better. I don't remember all the questions that we asked, but I do recall that the more we played, the more sinister the answers we received. We were sitting around the board, and uh, if the presence we were speaking with was demonic, it answered, yes. Because that's what a demonic voice sounds like, Tim. It sounds like the villain from Inspector Gadget. (laughs) Bring me Gadget. (laughs) Right. Well, you're not the the evil genius if you're like this. Are you demonic? (laughs) Yes. Of course I am. Well, now that's scary. Yeah. 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 I'm demonic. Boo, bitches. (laughs) As soon as the pointer hit the yes on the board, the candles to my left intensified and went completely out. This freaked me the F out as I looked at my friends and around the house demanding to know who was playing a prank. Who, damn it, who was playing a prank on me? My friends were just as scared as I was and just sat there with their mouths open and agape, Tim. Open and agape. Are you sure it isn't redundant? I began to look over my shoulder because I felt something watching me. I looked over in the direction of the kitchen and I saw an immense dark figure looking back at me. That was it for me. I ran out of the house right at that moment. Foolishly enough, I did not close my session with the board. I was 14 at the time and soon the night... Playing with the board was long forgotten. Throughout my high school years, I had numerous small occurrences that happened to me. Now that I look back at it, it's crazy to think that I dismissed all of those occurrences so easily. And at the age of 17, on a Wednesday night at 10.32 p.m., in another moment that I will never forget, many tried to pass this off as sleep paralysis, but I know that it was not. I have also had a medium confirm this occurrence that I had. But we will get to that later. I was lying in bed texting when I felt someone sit on my left foot. Confused, I tried to lift my head to see what it was, and to my shock, when I lift my head, it was violently thrown down and held, causing me to have difficulties breathing. I began fighting and praying for my life. Never in my life have I prayed so hard. Slowly, the pressure on my head was fading away as I began to lift my head. I was finally able to sit up, but there was something sitting on my leg. It was a dark hooded figure hunched over. I stared at it, unable to believe what I was witnessing. The thing began to turn its head to look at me, and the face still haunts me to this day. I came face to face with deep, deep red eyes, and then it began to slowly smile at me. The smile stretched across its face so unnaturally and hideous that fear overcame me. 
it just sat there smiling at me and laughing. I don't remember how I remembered, but in a strong voice, I said, in the name of God, I command you to leave. And just like that, it was gone. The thing disappeared right before my eyes. I felt so much relief that I began to cry and ran to my parents' room and slept there, too afraid to be in my own room. In my childhood home, I have many, many other occurrences that have happened, but I'm going to jump forward a few years. I had just moved back from Colorado and was returning home from watching my sister's performance. I walked in slowly behind my sister, who had just rushed off to the bathroom. As soon as I stepped into the house, I felt that something wasn't right. I looked up, and right before my eyes, this creature appeared and ran at me, all in attack mode. All I could think about was how I needed to defend myself, and I am really going to kick this demon, but as soon as the creature ran up to my face and I was bracing myself, it disappeared. All I could think about was, What the hell just happened? My mind was still processing it, and my body reacted. I ran out of the house, almost knocking over my dad, who was just about to walk in. In tears, I told him of what I just saw and what had just happened. I'm very fortunate to have parents that believe me in what was happening to me. Since they were also going through this as I was. When my dad and I entered the house, all you could sense was evil, Tim. Evil. It was terrifying to be in the house at that moment. My dad quickly called a bishop to come and bless the house, and when he arrived, I noticed that I was instantly angered that he was there, which is completely out of character for me. I've grown up knowing this bishop, and I have no hate for him, but at that moment, I wanted him out of there and not to perform the blessing. But I sat there fighting within myself as he conducted the blessing. It wasn't until the blessing was complete that I was finally able to approach the bishop and thank him. Since that day forward, more and more frequent events began to happen. I still to this day remember that demonic creature and what it looks like. I am once again jumping ahead in my story to try to keep this as short as possible. I was living in Vineyard, Utah in 2016. I had two roommates in my townhome who can account to you what I'm about to say and be witness to many more things that have happened. At this time, the things that were happening were every day. Loud bangs, footsteps up and down the stairs, doors being opened, voices being heard, shadow figures being seen. It had gotten so bad that my roommates and I needed help ASAP. We got in contact with the local LDS church to come and conduct a blessing. This just angered the spirit more. My roommate Hannah and I tried to cleanse the house ourselves. This angered the spirit even more. Finally, I got in contact with the paranormal group Badass Spirit Outlaws with the help of Jennifer. They were there the next day to help. From the start, as soon as Jennifer saw me, she said that she knew that the entity was attached to me, not the house, but to me. So she wanted to do a cleansing on me ASAP. I invited her in with her team, and they quickly got to work. Jennifer was the medium, so we started off talking. Once again, something within me was angered, and I wanted her out of my house. But I also knew that I needed her help, per my roommate. And Jennifer's team, they started or they stated that my whole demeanor had changed, that they were afraid that I was going to lunge and attach, attack the woman and uh, that was going to conduct the cleansing. But I was fighting with myself the whole time. They began to do a cleanse on me to break the hold the entity had. They began to spray me with holy water and sage, and I felt as if my skin were on fire. But I knew that I needed this. At the time that I was getting my first cleanse, Jennifer stated that the entity was laughing. We began to cleanse the house, and the more we got closer to being finished, the more the angered entity rose. We even heard it yell, No! to my roommate, Hannah. The cleansing was having such an effect on me that I broke out in a sweat and I threw up, but Jennifer encouraged me to finish. This night had a lot of crazy events happening. Since that night, I felt as if a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I didn't even know that I was carrying around the weight of this entity. I'm still afraid that this entity will find me again and attach itself, but Jennifer stated that it wouldn't. I could tell you many, many more stories that all tie into this entity. Thank you for your time, and I'm so sorry it was so long. I tried to keep my stories to a minimal, and that comes from Teresa Leany. Well, Teresa, don't be sorry. We love your stories. And now you can call us and leave more of your stories. You can tell the stories in your own voice or voices at 651-300-4977. 651-300-4977. And the more 
You tell the story, ladies and gentlemen. If you are detailed and you've got a great story to share, you never know. Tim may add some music and sound effects to it. You may be featured on an upcoming theater of the mind with your own story. How about that, Tim? Huh? Yeah. That a little sounds Tim like a magic. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Hi, Dave. My name is Brandon. I'm an avid listener of Darkness Radio. I'm only 19 years old. And I've had a few paranormal encounters, so I love listening to other people's stories, experiences, and thoughts on different subjects. Normally, I don't share my personal experiences unless people ask me about them. But I was listening to the show, and something one of the guests said got me thinking about my experiences. Maybe I'm reading a little too much into this. I'm just as much a skeptic as I am a believer in the paranormal. But I figured I'd send you an email and tell you about my experience to see what you think. When I was younger, around five years old, I was terrified of the movie E.T., The Extraterrestrial. I know what you might be thinking. E.T. was a good alien, and it was an uplifting movie. But something about that movie set me off to the point where my parents weren't even able to bring it up around me. Now, with this irrational fear came very intense night terrors that would plague me from the time I was five to about eight years old. I would have these night terrors every night or every other night for weeks at a time, and then they would stop abruptly. For around the same amount of time. The dream was actually very short. It would start with me waking up in my bed in the middle of the night. My room would be dark except for the lights of a computer, an internet router that my parents kept in my room out of convenience. Before I would go to sleep, my parents would always tuck me in, say a prayer, and go back downstairs, leaving the door behind them halfway open. The door was located at the foot of my bed, with my bed being up against the same wall that the door went through. When I would wake up in the dream, I would be staring at the dark corner that would normally be behind the door when it was open, except the door was closed. The lights from the computer equipment, bright orange and green, lighting up the room in every space except that corner. I would look around the room and realize that I was being affected by what I now believe is sleep paralysis. I couldn't move any part of my body. I couldn't speak. I couldn't scream. My heart would begin to race as I tried to call out for my parents. As I did this, it would happen. A shadowy figure, similar to the shape of a small alien, would step out from the dark corner and slowly make its way around my bed towards me. Its shadow would be outlined by the glow of the computer lights as I would try to scream and squirm to get free, eventually causing me to black out when the figure came around towards my face. After blacking out, I would come to and my parents would be grabbing and shaking me, telling me everything was going to be okay and it was just a bad dream. For the longest time, I thought that this night terror was simply my young mind manifesting my fear of E.T. in my sleep. Eventually, it became a rare occurrence as I got older, and I stopped having the nightmare altogether. It became a memory that my family would tease me about. And soon, I I would come to laugh at how my parents would describe them coming in and finding me screaming bloody murder with my eyes wide open in the middle of the night. I began to think about these nightmares a little differently when I had a similar experience last summer. Nothing better than your family scoffing at you and laughing at your night terrors, Tim, as they find you screaming and huddled in your bed. Oh, the comfort I feel for my parents <laughs> as they laugh at me and laugh and laugh, you sons of bitches. Yeah. I was home from college and I was staying at my mom's house, the same house I grew up in. As my parents are now divorced, since my sister went away to college after my freshman year of high school, I took her room, which is the front upstairs bedroom, and we moved out all of her old stuff into my room. The front bedroom is a lot larger than my old bedroom, having a rectangular shape with the long side sharing a wall with the front of the house. The door was parallel with this wall, extending into a large hallway that went down a staircase into our living room. All right, uh, our living room. Uh, Doors were on both sides of this hallway. Sorry, this is kind of a long paragraph, and I lose my way sometimes, Tim. It's old man problems. Going off into my old room, the master bedroom and a bathroom my sister and I used to share. One night, I was having a lot of trouble staying asleep. I went to sleep around 10 o'clock and would seemingly wake up every hour. Finally, I found myself falling asleep for the third time around 1 in the morning. Up until now, the light had been coming through my doorway from the living room because my mom was still awake. Now it was dark, and the tower fan standing near the door gave a humming white noise, allowing me to drift to sleep. Finally, I wake up for the fourth time that night. However, something was off. Firstly, I positioned on my side, which was odd, considering I always sleep on my stomach and rarely shift during the night. Secondly, the tall fan's bright blue power light that I had covered by pulling a beanie over the top of the fan was illuminating the room out of the corner of my eye. As I woke and noticed this, I began to turn my head over my shoulder, which is when I saw it. 
In the light of the fan stood a tall humanoid shadow. It was standing between the foot of my bed and the doorway that led down the hallway. It was stunned for a split second. However, I had not moved that so much, so I thought that it stayed still, it would go away. This thought left my mind as I realized my mom's bedroom was at the end of the hall and easily accessible to this intruder. In a split second, I twist my body upright as the figure darted down the hallway. As this happened, I heard the thumbs of its footsteps as it ran towards the stairs. Getting up quickly, I grabbed a large knife I kept in my bedside table and began turning on every light, searching the house. It had all happened so fast that I thought it was a person that broke into the house. As I made my way down the hall, quickly checking each upstairs room, my mom opened up her door and asked me why I was stomping down the hallway in the middle of the night. I told her that I'd heard someone in the house and to go back to her room until I said it was safe. Now, I'm six foot five and 225 pounds, so I'm pretty confident I could take a robber, especially since I had my knife. After checking the whole house, finding every door and window locked, I realized what had just happened. I had just had some type of paranormal encounter. Now, I have had ghost-like encounters in this house before, but nothing like what I experienced that night. My mom thinks I'm crazy, but she has since bought a gun, considering she lives alone, so I know she somewhat believes my story. It wasn't until I listened to a recent darkness radio show that I started to make the connection between what used to happen to me as a kid and what happened that night. This is just speculation, but I could have had some type of extraterrestrial encounter. Or was it ghost-related? Or maybe it's all summed up to dreams and imagination. All I know is what happened that night. I was completely awake. I have no doubt about that. Now, as far as what used to happen to me when I was a kid, like I said, I'm just speculating. All I know is that it all seems similar and to be coincidental. Anyway, I just wanted to share my story with you because you've always urged listeners to write in explaining their encounters. Thank you again for taking the time to read this, and thank you for providing people curious in the paranormal with a daily fix to their cravings. You and the whole Darkness Radio crew are awesome, and I can't wait to hear more stories in the future. Thanks again. Best, and that comes from Brandon. Well, thank you, Brandon. We appreciate that. One more story, Tim. One more tale to share tonight. How about that? All right. Greetings, guys. First off, thank you for your response to my previous emails. I look forward to haunted school shows. I thought I would try out a pair of share for you as well. I have had many paranormal experiences over the years, starting when I was a teenager and right up into my current years. I figured I might as well start with one of the first experiences. I was in my mid-teens, just about uh, enough old enough to drive, when a group of friends and I who were curious about spirits and the paranormal started talking about Ouija boards, Tim. Ouija boards. A couple of us had read books about positive experiences and wisdom gained through these spirit boards, boards and decided we'd give it a try. Our families did not own any boards. In fact, they would never have them in the house due to religious backgrounds, upbringing, etc. For that reason, we constructed our own board consisting of a taped down, uh, taped down paper letters, a tabletop, and an upturned drinking glass. After ensuring the glass would slide easily across the board and that the letters were properly taped down, we got ready to make contact. The night was black as sackcloth. My parents were out for the night, and we decided we would make our attempt by candlelight. Myself and two friends lightly touched the glass and called out once, twice, and nothing happened. We were, of course, crestfallen, but decided to take a short break and try again. The three of us left the board together. We went to the kitchen to get food, and when we returned, it was at this point that one of my friends claimed that the glass was not where it had been when we left. The accusations started about someone moving the glass in our group, or that my friend was mistaken. We knew, however, that all three of us had gone together into the kitchen and that no one else was in the house. I also found myself having to concur that the glass was indeed moved from its original place. We decided this was a sign that something wanted to communicate, and we resumed our experiment. We called out once. Nothing happened. We called out again, and the glass slid easily across the board. The entity identified itself as DQ. To this day, we don't know who or what it was. We asked typical questions and received typical answers until our third friend started to become less then serious with DQ, he was loudly and mockingly asking questions about whether or not the entity was a demon, questioning its sexuality, asking if it knew anything, and just being very rude. It was at the point that the glass left the table. None of the three of us could gain enough 
purchase on the glass to do much more than send it slightly over the edge of the table we were using, but somehow this glass flew in a straight line five feet, hit the wall, and shattered, thus ending the session with DQ. But our experiences with whomever or whatever DQ was weren't done. I've seen many storms in my life. Most storms have caught me by surprise. So I have had yet to learn very quickly to look further and understand I am not capable of controlling the weather, to excise the art of patience, and to respect any fury of nature. That comes from a quote from Paulo Coelho, Tim, to wrap up that story. All right. Not sure what that story has to do with, or that, that little deal had to do with that, but that's it. So that's it for tonight. We're done. My voice is hashed. Yours is hashed. We're tired. But we'll be back again tomorrow with more Beyond the Darkness. And remember, you can call us now or you can text us 651-300-4977 if you want to share your thoughts on the show or if you'd like to share your own paranormal encounters. We invite you to do that. Call 651-300-4977. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you for listening to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. <laughs>